Hi, welcome back to The Wandering Wesley, and this is Chaplain Greg. Uh, so good to see you again. Uh, today we're going to have something special. Uh, we talked last week about the Psalms, and one of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 136. So a few years ago I did a sermon on Psalm 136 and talked about a very, very special word that is found throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, and that's the word chesed. And as you will notice, there is a, a lot of meanings to that word. It doesn't just mean one, there's no one-to-one -one English to Hebrew correlation. So we're going to talk about that. In the sermon, I talk about a bookmark that I gave away to the congregation while they were there. If you are interested in one of those bookmarks, uh, please email me at wanderingwesleyan at hotmail.com. Again, that's wanderingwesleyan at hotmail.com. And if you have anything to say that you'd like to say to me that you'd rather not put into the uh, comment section, um, go ahead and uh, and uh, email me. I'm, I'm happy. I read those emails every single day. And uh, so... Uh, wanderingwesleyan at hotmail.com. Um, if you are liking this uh, this series, please like and subscribe. I'd appreciate that, and uh, that way we can get this out, and the YouTubes will uh, distribute it a little bit more and, and get more people looking at it. But until next week, this is Chaplain Greg. Enjoy this sermon on Chassad. Hi, can you hear me? That jazz you up. I don't know what was. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, let's pray. Father God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. So good morning, church. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Um, it's, it's an honor to be speaking with you all again and sharing the Word of God. And I... Uh, you know, I, I appreciate Pastor Brandon entrusting the pulpit to me. Um, when he asked me to do this sermon, I, I had something ruminating in my head for a, probably about a year. And uh, he said, well, we're doing the Psalms, so can you stick to the Psalms? I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, unlike the last time I talked in July, uh, this is not a school project. So uh, I don't know what kind of grade I'm going to get, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Now, usually when a preacher comes up and starts preaching, he uses the text right up front. He says, this is the text, then we dissect it and look at it and pull it apart a little bit. We're not going to do that this morning. Uh, our text is going to be Psalm 136, and uh, we're going to read it together liturgically at the end of the service. Uh, it is a psalm that is marked by the repeated use of one word. Now, the thing that struck me the most about what we just sang and the songs that Kathy picked out was how many different ways we can talk about God's love, his faithful love, his enduring love, his love endures forever. You know, so many different ways, but all of that comes from one Hebrew word, and we're going to talk about that today. Now, up front, I want to just say that uh, I am borrowing heavily from Michael Card. If go to the next one. Um, he has been a huge influence on me uh, musically, theologically. If you've ever heard of Michael Card, he makes some amazing, amazing music. You listen to one of his albums, and you've pretty much been through seminary. It's, it's deep stuff. Um, but he has a book out called Inexpressible that is about this Hebrew word. He even did an album of music called The Kindness of God. Beautiful reflections on this Hebrew word. And I recommend to you his podcast, In the Studio with Michael Card. If what I talk about resonates with you, you want to look deeper into it, go to that podcast and look through, look for titles like The Kindness of God and Hesed, which is the word we're going to be talking about. And uh, you'll, you'll get a whole lot better rendition of what I'm going to give you this morning. Because he is just, he's a brilliant guy. But before we get to the word itself, let's talk a little bit about words in general. Because words are important. It's how I convey to you what's going on in this brain. If I don't have words, we can't connect. Words connect us. We have a common language. We have English 
and some have Spanish and other languages, but that's what connects us together. Now let me state something that is just blindingly obvious. Words mean things. Deep, right? Well, think about it. Words have meaning, but words change their meaning over time. Some words stay the same, but other words change over time. So let's take the word cool, all right? Let's say I go back to 1920, and I'm in Detroit, and I see a Model T roll off the assembly line, and I look at it and say, that's cool. Somebody come up and feel it and say, yeah, it's a little cool, but what does temperature have to do with anything? Jump forward to today, and I see a 2021 uh, Indian chieftain roll off the assembly line <laughs> in Wisconsin, and I say, that's cool. Everybody's going to know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, so words change over time. Words take on different meanings. They're not static. So languages that are static, that don't change, are dead languages. Think of Latin. There's no more new Latin words coming around because that's a dead language. For many years, up until 1948, Hebrew was sort of a dead language. It was used in religious ceremonies, but it wasn't used as a common language. Now in Israel, it is a common language. They'd had to update it, because in uh, ancient Hebrew, there's no word for television, cell phone, automobile, that sort of thing. Uh, air conditioning. Yeah, I definitely need air conditioning. A word for air conditioning over there. Words can change meanings over time, but also words have multiple meanings. Do I read a book on how to book a trip? Okay. To same word, used differently. Even though it's spelled differently, if I say, they're going over there to get their lunch, you know what I'm saying. I'm using the same word, but it's in different ways. So language is alive. Words are alive, and they, they have depth of meaning that uh, are, it's really interesting to delve into the meaning and how words come about. But let's dig a little bit deeper. So the more words language has, the more specific their meanings become. Okay? And the more synonyms or same words there are. So let's say uh, I see a sunrise, and I say that's beautiful, gorgeous, stunning. Sort of saying the same thing. Maybe from different perspectives, sort of saying the same thing. Now the average English-speaking American knows about 35,000 words. We all have 35,000 words or so floating up in our, in our noggins, and we use them. And we, we talk about things. If you have a PhD, like Dr. Harper, Hopper, um, my guess is you're around 50,000 words. Um, the late great columnist uh, of National View, um, William F. Buckley, probably had around 75,000 words. He had such an expansive vocabulary, nobody could really understand them. So, um, so the more words you have, <clears throat> the more specific those meanings are going to become. However, ancient words have fewer words in their vocabulary. So taking the New Testament, ancient Greek writers had about 4,000 words at their disposal. There's about 4,000 different words in the New Testament. Still a lot, but not as much as our modern languages today. Let's go a little bit deeper. Hebrew has only 400 words. That means that each word has a depth of meaning that you could never really stop exploring. And that's where we're coming to our word for today. And that word is chesed. If you go to the next one, there you go. In Hebrew, Hebrew is such a pretty language. If you've ever seen Hebrew written out, it's just, I mean, that font doesn't really do it justice. But boy, it's a beautiful language. Um, you read it right to left, like we learned when we had our uh, series on Yahweh. 
I am. Uh, so the first letter there is the word is the letter chet. So really, you're supposed to pronounce that chesed. But guess what? Ancient linguists uh, or uh, academic linguists who study ancient dialects believe that the Galilean accent, so the accent that Jesus had, the accent that Peter and Paul and the rest of the crew had, would soften the ch part, so it would be more chesed. So if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. I'm going to use chesed. So chet is the first one. Samech is the second letter, the S sound and Dali at the end for the D. Now, those little dots below there are the vowels. So, ancient Hebrew was a language built on consonants. And somewhere around the Babylonian exile, they figured, they started losing how they pronounced these words because, you know, some would put an A in there and others would put an E in there. And, you know, it just got confusing. So they developed a system for vowels. These aren't letters. It's more of a system saying, use this vowel in here, but it's not really a letter. These letters are important. Chet, Samek, and Dalit. Chesed. If uh, I could ask the volunteers now to pass out the bookmarks, um, you're all going to get a bookmark. And on that bookmark, I have printed for you some of the meanings of this word has said. So out of the six major English translations of the Bible, this word is translated 169 different ways. This is just a small smattering of that. Oh, let's see, interesting. Oh, I got that. The word is used 250 times in the Hebrew Bible and 127 times in the Psalms. So when Pastor Brandon asked me to do uh, the Psalms this morning, the first one I thought was, Psalm 136, where it's repeated over and over and over, his hesed endures forever. So, with that, 127 times in the psalm. So wherever you see, when you're reading a song, God's love, his faithfulness, his enduring love, his kindness. I love that word, kindness. It's the word hesed. But the most important passage concerning Hesed is actually not in the Psalms, it's in Exodus. So um, the next slide we're going to look at, Exodus 34, verses 6 through 8. Now let's set the scene here. Uh, Moses had le has led Israel out of Egypt. They've crossed the Red Sea. Pharaoh goes for a swim. And then they end up in the wilderness and... Moses trots up Mount Sinai, gets the Ten Commandments, comes down. Israelites are worshiping a gold cow, breaks the, breaks the Ten Commandments. Big disaster happens, and he goes back up the mountain to receive a new set of Ten Commandments. And this is where we're at. And one of the things he's asking God, Moses is asking God, let me see you. Who are you? Who is this God? He's self-defining. I am who I am. But that doesn't tell you everything you need to know. So he says, let me see you. And I'm going to be reading out of the Christian Standard Bible here. The Lord passed in front of him, so Moses was only able to see his back. He wasn't able to see his face because then he, he wouldn't be able to live because it's just so glorious and amazing, he just keel right over. So he could just see his back. And the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, the Lord... The Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. Hasad. And truth. Those two words come together an awful lot in the Bible. Hasad we met. Grace and truth. Faithful love and truth. Maintaining faithful love. Hasad again. To a thousand generations. Forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. But he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing consequences of the father's iniquity, God's justice, on the children and grandchildren of the third and fourth generations. 
So what's Moses' response to this? Moses immediately knelt low on the ground and worshipped. See, God first showed Moses his character through these words. And central in his description of who he is, is this word hased, which is used twice. That tells us that this is the important part. It's sort of like going up to the top of the mountain. It's the peak, and then everything comes back down. Hased is the defining characteristic of God. No wonder why it has so many different definitions. But in looking at the passages where we use the word hased, we need to understand how the Hebrew mind thinks. Okay, so we 21st century Westerners think in terms of nouns. So I look at that and I see chair. A Hebrew would look at it and say sitting in a chair because they think in terms of verbs. Um, I could say uh, here's a plate of food. They would think here's a plate to eat food. You know, so they think in terms of verbs. So that means has said is not just a thing that God is or has, it's what he does. It's an action. Now, let's go to Psalm 42, verse 8. And this was the psalm that uh, Brandon used last week. The Lord will send his faithful love, has said, by day, his song will be with him in the night, a prayer of, to the God of my life. God is showing his said to the writer of this psalm. Going to Psalm 51, it says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to what? Has said, your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. God demonstrates his has said by forgiving, actively forgiving us. Now, you can think, oh, this is good Old Testament stuff. Guess what? The guys who wrote the New Testament were Jews. So they thought like Jews. They thought in Hebrew. If they knew Greek really well, they probably thought in Greek too, but their native language was Hebrew. And so they thought like Hebrews, and when they wrote the New Testament, they came upon the same problem that we in English have. Well, how do you, def how do you get a one-for-one -one correspondence with this word? And you can't get a one-for-one, -one, so you've got to use several words. And here's just a few. So from Matthew 5, 7, where it says, Blessed are the merciful, and that's Eliemon, for they will be shown mercy, Eliehu. So, this word, Eliehu, mercy, is the word that those who transcribed the Septuagint. I remember the Septuagint was a version of the Hebrew Bible that was translated a couple hundred years before Jesus from Hebrew into Greek. And those folks have the same problem that the New Testament writers have that we have, is what do we do with this word? So they, by and large, use Eliehu, mercy, for this. Um, which sort of limits your understanding of it. But Eliehu is, is an important one. The next one uh, is the word agapo or agape. Agapo is the uh, verb. We show agapo love or we have agape love. 1 John 3.23. And this is his commandment to believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and to love, agapo, one another as he commanded us. The last word I'm going to use is the word charis. So Romans, and this is uh, chapter 3, verse 24, all are justified freely by his grace, charis, through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. All of these words are the ways the New Testament writer, writers express this inner thought, Hebrew thought they had of hased. So think about all the times love and forgiveness and grace and mercy show up in the New Testament. I mean, it's just, it permeates the New Testament. 
And it all stems from this little word, chesed. Do you see the impact of this little, little tiny Hebrew word? It's immense. And here's what really, if you, if you get nothing else out of what I'm talking about this morning, get this. God shows us chesed. God demonstrates his, his chesed to us. By that, we need to show hased to others. That's our job as Christ followers. When we put our faith, hope, and trust into Jesus, we are filled with his Holy Spirit, which is the very presence of God itself. It's the same presence that was in the tabernacle in the wilderness, in the temple in Jerusalem. It was the same presence that raised Jesus from the dead and fell on the disciples at Pentecost. We inherit that. So we inherit God's qualities, and his defining quality is hesed. And this church, I have noticed, is really good at hesed. Um, I think of Elizabeth, who shows hesed to those who are in need, to those who are down on their luck. Think of Theta, who told us the story of how she showed Hesed to a homeless woman. I think of my brother Paul, and uh, he leads a Monday morning men's group that is just wonderful, and he shows us Hesed through that. But to me, the, the sweetest act of Hesed in this church um, is from Laura Sink. If you've ever received a hug from Laura Sink, you know, you know what Hesed is, don't you? The greatest act of Hesed was Jesus on the cross. He didn't have to go there. Like that, he could have gotten off. But because of his Hesed, he took that for us. So we are obligated. It's not, a, it's not an option. It's an obligation to show Hesed to others. If you look at this bookmark, with all these definitions. Keep it handy. Keep it in your Bibles. Whenever you come upon these words, pull it out and just consider some of the definitions. Some of them will fit. Most of them will fit. Some may not. That's okay. But it's meant for you to bask and soak in the love of God through his word. And that brings me to Psalm 136. And this psalm is a liturgical psalm, and the main speaker states the first line, and then the congregation responds with, his hesed endures forever. Psalm 136 tells the story of Israel, reminding us repeatedly of God's kindness and his love. It invites us to use this format for our own stories. Now, for your homework, yes, when Greg preaches, you get homework. <laughs> for your homework, what I would like you to do is take a time in your life that's a God time. Whether when he came through in a big way, when he seemed absent to you. Maybe you're going through that now. Maybe you're going through a really hard time now. Uh, dealing with depression, anxiety, some sort of uh, sin that may be in your life that you're having trouble getting over. Write it down, sentence by sentence. And in between each sentence, pick one of these definitions and write, His faithful love endures forever. His loving kindness endures forever. His mercy endures forever. In between each line, save that piece of paper. Reflect back on it. Do more. So, with that, uh, Kathy, you'd come up. We're going to read Psalm 136. I'm going to read the first line, and you're going to uh, respond with, His hasad endures forever. And when you're doing that, think about these definitions. Soak it in. Soak in the different ways of exploring God's love. Because God's love is eternal. 
It's everlasting. And sometimes we don't get that. But think about it. There's no sin you could stop committing in your life to make God love you more. And there's no sin that you could ever commit in your life to make God love you less. It's eternal. There's no beginning. There's no end. It's just your decision. Do you want it? Do you want that source of power and love? So I ask you all to stand. And as I read through Psalm 136, think about these definitions and reply back with Hesed endures forever. Let's try it. One, two, three. Perfect. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. He alone does great wonders. He made the heavens skillfully. He spread the land on the waters. He made the great lights. The sun to rule by the day. The moon to rule the stars by night. He struck the firstborn of the Egyptians and brought Israel out from among them. With a strong hand and outstretched arm, he divided the Red Sea and led Israel through, but hurled Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. He led his people in the wilderness. He struck down great kings and killed famous kings. Sihon, king of the Amorites. Og of Bashan. And gave their land as an inheritance. An inheritance to Israel, his servant. He remembered us in our humiliation and rescued us from our foes. He gives food to every creature. Give thanks to the God of heaven. Now, if this word has touched you in a way, If you are needing God's Hasid love today, if there's some sort of physical illness, sickness that you have, spiritual heartache that you have, if you're dealing with depression, anxiety, anything like that, Carrie and I are going to be over in this corner, and Pastor Brandon and Angela are going to be in this corner. I invite you, come forward, receive prayer, receive healing. If you need a touch of God's has said today, come forward and let us pray for you. This is the word of God for the people of God.